Many moons ago, I was on a twilight stroll with a British friend visiting the Bogan Isle. As we walked along the river, she looked to the heavens and exclaimed, What on earth is that? I glanced up and immediately recognised the huge membranous wingspan of the creature above and replied, Oh yeah, that's a flying fox. Upon reflection, it is strange that we as Australians take it in our stride that some of the largest bat species in the world fly by the thousands every night above our heads. And we think nothing more of it than, Oh yeah, it's kind of cool, eh? It piqued my curiosity then, as it still does now. And I'm left with two questions. Who are they? And where are they going? Bats. Let's give you the lowdown on the up high. Bats are the only mammals and the last group of animals that evolved to fly. No gliding doesn't count. This evolution happened 50 odd million years ago. There's something of a gap in the fossil record regarding bats, and deep time is notoriously hard to penetrate. First there were gliding mammals, then a big fat question mark, then bats. Profit? And profit they did, to the point where one in five mammal species on Earth are now bats. Their ability to fly is thanks to those long fingers that form wings covered by a thin skin membrane. Finger webbing flight is a kooky concept, never thought it would take off personally. They clearly took a page out of the pterosaur's playbook and stuck a few extra fingers in to get the job done. Their remaining digits stick out like a sore thumb, but help them to hook onto things. This skin flap wing setup does have an advantage over feathers, as bats are generally more agile than most birds. The drawback is those wings are very fragile. Though their skin heals, those holes take a toll, and like hang gliding with Swiss cheese, you'll quickly find yourself going from high flyer to transpirer. This is where flying foxes come in. Some people think they aren't bats. They are. To be fair, it's probably the same people who think marsupials aren't mammals. Flying foxes are mega bats of the family Pteropodidae. They differ from their microbat cousins in a number of ways, the major one being echolocation, when the sound waves wave back. Flying foxes in many ways are defined by their lack of echolocation. They possess small ears without a defined ear flap called a tragus, which microbats use to direct sound waves. They also lack the leaf noses of many microbats that allow them to make ultrasonic snorts and locate food. Flying foxes instead opted for big eyes and long snouts to simply sniff out and spot potential feeding sites. It's this appearance that gives them the name Fox. Despite having this moniker forcefully thrust upon them by us, flying foxes, as well as other bats, are as equally related to rhinos and deer as they are to canines. Australia is home to four species, the grey-headed, spectacled, black, and little red flying foxes, with each one distributed in different but overlapping parts of the country. The most common, especially in the urban areas of the eastern states, are those of the grey-headed persuasion. They are our largest native bat, with a wingspan reaching up to one metre, and can be recognised by that characteristic grey coat, topped off with a fashionable red collar. These flying foxes congregate in enormous groups called camps. The bats in these camps can easily number in the thousands. If you've ever stood near one, you'll hear the din of a thousand strangulated pigs screaming into the void. Yeah, they don't yap on the ultrasonic wavelength. Each of these camps forms part of a giant interconnected network across the country. Our grey nomads are transitory by nature and will frequently come and go from these hanging hostels. And it means you'll rarely see the same group twice. If you look closely, you may notice the manifold social interactions behind their calls. Males and females can be hard to distinguish but the former can often be seen aggressively defending their favourite branch from a newcomer. Females on the other wing can easily be spotted nursing their young. Flying fox pups cling to their mum's belly for the first six weeks of life, including during flight. Then they're ready to strike out on their own. Because of their massive skin flaps, winged wolves have a hard time regulating heat, as most of it escapes through the wing membranes. As such, flying foxes prefer warmer climates, which is why they're so concentrated around the tropics. 
It's quite astonishing that they occur as far south as Melbourne, the most southerly range of any flying fox species, which goes to show the adaptability of the greyheads. In these regions, they sometimes go into a state of torpor, a batatonic form of semi-hibernation which conserves energy during the colder months. Even still, they have seasonal camps all along the east coast and the megabats of southern Victoria will migrate north during winter, with only a small number staying behind for the long haul. During the day, these megabats just hang around. Heh, <laughs> got him. Sleeping, preening, and socialising. Whoa, neither well hung or hung well, but I admire the confidence. But at sunset, that all changes. What follows is one of the most spectacular sights in Australia. Thousands of flying foxes take wing en masse in a display that's simultaneously awe-inspiring and a little bit creepy. Winged whippets spread out in all directions for up to 50 kilometers in search of one thing, a feed. While microbats specialize in hunting insects, flying foxes prefer something sweeter. The spawn of Dracula traded in hemoglobin for blood orange. They predominantly suck down nectar and fruit, preferring eucalypts, paper barks, and figs. This gives them their other well-known epithet, the fruit bat. Flying foxes digest fruit insanely fast, often within 20 minutes, mostly because they consume everything in juice form. In fact, they crush fruit against the hardened palate on the roofs of their mouths just to extract the juice and then spit out the pulp. Nighttime Nutribullet. Their fast digestion also means they disperse seeds quickly out the back door. When one's anus is set to fully automatic, they can easily blow through 60,000 salvos of seed in a single night during their green gorilla raids. Soaring setters have great memories and are able to mark points of interest on their minimap. They'll return to the same spots each year when things are blooming. A fun little aside, they have been recently discovered to occasionally eat insects to supplement their diet with some protein. Flying foxes tend to go for the slow-moving but nutritious cicadas, which they juice in the same fashion as the figs, before spitting out their dehydrated husks. Their role as pollinators can't be understated. Because flying foxes prefer to eat eucalyptus nectar and fly long distances, they're perfectly situated to carry pollen from one forest to the next. They're essentially giant bees, floating farmers, airborne arborists, as they migrate all along the east coast, hovering hounds will coat their fur in plant powder, then pollinate trees hundreds or even thousands of kilometers away. A single flying fox fitted with a tracking device was found to travel up to 12,000 kilometers in a crisscross pattern between Melbourne and Bundaberg, like some kind of genetically engineered French backpacker. Through pollination and seed dispersal, they benefit over 90 different types of Australian trees. In turn, those trees provide habitat for countless other native animals. Entire ecosystems rely on the flying fox to survive. And following bushfires, they airdrop in new seeds and pollinate the new growth, helping the landscape heal. They've done more for this country than you or I might hope to achieve. And how do we repay them? Australia and those aren't birds wheeling above the trees, they are flying foxes. Destructive members of the bat family that take a heavy toll of valuable fruit crops of all kinds. Shooting parties go out to try and reduce the numbers as the huge bats hang at rest on the branches. But so great are the colonies that the hunters wage an almost hopeless campaign against a grave menace to the farmer. The fact that grey-headed flying foxes are listed as vulnerable and spectacled flying foxes are endangered might give you a clue as to how they're treated. This is largely because of habitat destruction, as large tracts of eucalypt forests continue to be logged nationwide. The devastation has caused flying foxes to flee their traditional habitats to urban areas in search of food and shelter. Prior to the 80s, Melbourne had very few megabats until they established a huge colony in the botanical gardens. This became a huge issue because they were believed to be wrecking rare plant species, and I kid you not, because they stink. 
they do stink. The Botanic Gardens commissars wanted to have them shot, but a large number of protesters stepped in and convinced them to consider another solution. In 2002, hundreds of people came together banging makeshift drums and releasing weather balloons to scare the bats out of the gardens. And it worked. The bats fled and took up a permanent residence in Yarra Bend and Geelong, where they remain to this day. They were previously absent from Adelaide, but since 2010 have made themselves at home there. They truly are desperate. Similar situations are mirrored across the nation. Flying foxes are slowly moving westward across the country in search of prime habitat, with new camps being sighted as far as Port Augusta. There is, however, a more insidious factor to their decline. Heat waves. Flying foxes are very susceptible to extreme heat as they roost in the canopies of trees, often in direct sunlight. They've got several heat mitigating strategies like licking and fanning themselves, as well as dipping their fur in water and slurping it off their own bodies. However, at temperatures over 42 degrees, it becomes too much and no amount of hot bat action with tongue will stop them dropping like flies. During the heat waves leading up to the 2020 bushfires, one third of Australia's spectacled flying fox population perished from heat stroke. This is a problem that will only get worse with a more extreme climate in the future. Moving closer to urban areas also brings on a host of new threats. Just like possums, flying foxes are often tragically killed via contact with the final boss of hostile architecture, power lines. To the point where a study of greyhead deaths found that 30% of them were due to electrocution, which was a shock to the system. Other causes of death include entanglement in agricultural netting, as well as barbed wire. We're not being very hospitable hosts to our guests. These threats to their population are made worse by the fact that female flying foxes usually give birth to only one pup per year, which means their recovery is slow. Grey-headed flying foxes are also seasonal breeders, with a single breeding event each year. These factors combined with their lifespan of between 15 and 20 years suggests that they have a low natural mortality rate. This means that the flying fox decline is almost entirely because of us. There is one more thing we need to cover. Disease. It's no secret that bats and disease go hand in hand. Living in such tight quarters makes it easy for pathogens to spread, and bats have had to develop supercharged immune systems to fight them. The result, of course, is that bat viruses have had to become supercharged themselves. One such pathogen is Australian bat lysivirus, a close relative of rabies. What starts out with flu-like symptoms progresses rapidly into paralysis, delirium, convulsions, and finally, death. A young boy tragically died from lysivirus after a flying fox scratched him in 2013. This episode was chronicled by 60 Minutes. I wouldn't wish what happened to him and his family on my worst enemy, but I find 60 Minutes' framing of the subject misleading. 60 Minutes swiftly glossed over the statistics of lysivirus deaths and then left out some much needed context. What they did correctly mention was this. There have been three recorded lysivirus fatalities in Australia, ever. But for reference, in the same time period there have been 11 fatal shark attacks. This means you're over three times more likely to be killed by a shark, which is already exceedingly rare. A fatal shark attack in Oz is a 1 in 8 million chance. You want to know how likely a fatal bat attack is? About a 1 in 29 million chance. Less likely than being struck by lightning twice. And most nights, thousands of bats fill our skies above towns and cities. It stands to reason that any one of those could be carrying the virus. They also neglected to mention that less than 1% of our flying foxes actually carry the virus, despite having a team of dedicated writers and researchers. Meanwhile, yours truly managed a quick Google search and some rough calculations. Clearly, they were too occupied scaremongering about killer bats and milking the grief of a devastated family for ratings, as is their bread and butter. Can't believe it's not a current affair. And this isn't to completely diminish the threat of lysivirus. I urge everyone to avoid physical contact with bats unless you're a trained carer 
and have the necessary rabies vaccine. If you do get scratched by a bat, go straight to the emergency room. A rabies injection will save you if it's given quickly enough. And look, bats aren't out to get you. They're just up there doing their thing. We just need to respect them. Why is bro going in so hard to bat for the bats? Someone's got to. Flying foxes and bats in general have had some bad PR, especially in recent years. But I would argue that there's far more redeeming about them than not. Flying foxes are adorable. They put on a dazzling show every single night and they play a crucial role as caretakers of our ecosystem. Imagine having a million strong workforce that meticulously looks after the environment night after night and they do it for free. Sure, they might pinch a mango here and there, but the value they provide far outweighs any negative impacts. We should be helping them, not clipping their wings at every turn. And do yourself a favor. Find your nearest flying fox camp, head over at sunset on a clear night and just watch. It never fails to impress. This is Darcy, signing off. See you next time around.